Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How's everybody on this uh, nice, warm evening? Good, good. Well, thanks for coming out tonight. I know you'd probably all rather be at the beach or something, but we appreciate you coming tonight. <laughs> Let's just jump right in. Uh, rising, rising out of the ashes of the lost Mars Polar Lander mission in 1998 and the Mars Surveyor 2001 program, the Phoenix Mars Lander mission will, for the first time in history, dig beneath Mars' northern polar Arctic in search of signs of ancient habitats of possible organisms that may have flourished on Mars billions of years ago. But of course, the spacecraft has to get there first. The Phoenix lander's entry, descent, and landing system harkens back to the Mars landing system used by the Viking landers in the 1970s. No airbags this time around. Are we crazy, one might ask? Not exactly. And tonight you'll learn how, the hows and whys behind the change. And tonight we have two speakers to help sort out all of this information. Tonight's first speaker covering the science aspect of the mission is the Phoenix Deputy Project Scientist, Dr. Deborah Bass, from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Prior to coming to JPL, she received her bachelor's degree in geology from the University of Pennsylvania and her PhD in planetary geology from the University of California, Los Angeles. Once at JPL, she became the science operations systems engineer for the Mars Exploration Rover Project during its development phase, and more recently worked as the MER Deputy Science Team Chief. Her research centers on the Martian water cycle, focusing on surface atmosphere interactions in the North Polar region. Deborah also participates in a variety of outreach activities for the space program, from conducting print, television, and radio interviews, to engaging in public speaking opportunities for all manner of audiences. In her hours away from JPL, she spends as much time as she can with her husband, twin baby daughters, and German shepherd dogs. She also enjoys yoga, hiking, cooking, and drinking fine wine. I think we all enjoy that. <laughs> Representing the engineering side of the house tonight, our guest is Mr. Rob Manning, a graduate of Caltech and Whitman College, where he studied math, physics, computer science, and control systems. He came to JPL in 1980, and he has, since 2004, been the Mars Exploration Program Chief Engineer at JPL, where he is responsible for ensuring that current and future missions to Mars succeed. No easy task. In early 2008, he was also named the Chief Engineer for the Mars Science Laboratory Mission a new rover mission set to land on Mars in 2010. Prior to these roles, he led the spacecraft systems engineering team for the Mars Exploration Rover project that landed the twin rovers on the surface of Mars in early, early 2004. Before that, Rob was the chief engineer for the very exciting 1997 Mars Pathfinder mission, where he also led its entry, descent, and landing team. Prior to Pathfinder, he developed computers and fault-tolerant electronic systems for JPL's deep space missions. In 2004, Space News Magazine named Rob as one of 100 people who made a difference in civil, commercial, and military space since 1989. And as a result of his good luck at JPL, Rob has received two NASA medals and is in the Aviation Week Magazine Space Laureate Hall of Fame in the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming tonight's guests, Dr. Deborah Bass and Mr. Rob Manning. Right here. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> this doesn't bode well, okay? Well, thank you for that nice introduction, Mark. Appreciate it. So, this talk is entitled Landing a Backhoe on Mars, otherwise known as the Phoenix Mars Scout Mission. Now, I see a number of familiar faces in this audience, which tells me that many of you probably already know a little bit about Mars, a little bit about Phoenix, so we'll see how this goes, and you know, if I see folks starting to nod off, we'll just kind of pick up the pace here, okay? All right, so I first wanted to start out telling you, why is it that we even should care about Mars, okay? What is it about Mars that seems to be so cool and so intriguing? Well, the fact is, is that it looks like there was ancient liquid water flowing all over the surface of Mars. Mars Global Surveyor found evidence of these gullies on Mars, and then the Exploration Rovers found tremendous evidence that there were vast quantities of water over, over Mars with these what were called blueberries. That's that little nodule in the center. You know what, do I have a pointer? Yes, I think I see a pointer here. So these nodules appeared to be kind of like, um, 
like a pearl would be found in an oyster. And you have to have water in order to form these things. So you have wave action that moves a grain back and forth and kind of rolls it up. It's called an oocyte. That's the technical term for it. But frankly, blueberry sounds pretty good, too. So again, what is it about water, about Mars? Well, we also believe that there may be some more recent liquid water on Mars. Um, we know that water is present as frozen ice. Uh, we've seen from Odyssey spacecraft that there appears to be a whole lot of, of hydrogen under the north polar region of Mars. This is the northern sort of a polar stereographic projection with the polar cap at the center. Blue or darker colors indicates this frozen, this, excuse me, this hydrogen. So it appears, if we do the models, that the only thing that this hydrogen could be consistent with is H2O. So if you look at this, it looks like a, there's an awful lot of this stuff. And you see that here on the surface of this, it's really bright, which means that the surface polar cap is water ice. Now that's what Odyssey saw, but we've already known that, okay? Vikings saw that a long time ago. We know that the northern polar cap, exposed polar cap, is water ice on the surface, as well as some, ice, some dust and some sand and so forth. But so you keep extending this water ice, and you see that it still has sort of a color out here that could be consistent with that, that, that hydrogen beneath the surface. So in addition to that, we see in uh, isolated craters, we see water ice that appears to be also at the surface. So this is kind of like spring skiing is the way I look at it, all right? The temperatures, the air temperatures are warm, right? Spring skiing, you might be wearing shorts. It's not you know, 20 degrees with the sleet coming down and you're miserable as you're skiing along. No, spring skiing, it's actually quite nice. You can get a sunburn the whole bit, and yet there's snow on the ground, right? So that's what this kind of thing is. You can have frozen water ice even though the air temperature appears to be a lot warmer than you'd expect. And the, we, well, there's a bunch of different reasons for that, but one possibility is that it's because the ground is still cold. And so it acts as a cold trap for that water ice, and it remains there. So NASA, Mars program, is all about following the water. Water is the common thread that links between determining if life ever arose on Mars. On Earth, wherever we find water, we pretty much find life. And the fact is, is that human beings are about 70% water. So we must have water for life to exist, all right? So that's how you connect those two guys up. Then additionally, we want to characterize the climate of Mars. So weather is everyday pattern. That's what you talk to the meteorologist about, okay, the person on the news. Climate is putting weather together over longer time scales, all right? And we're always, we're talking about global warming these days and all of that kind of thing. Well, that's because we're talking about long-term climate. Well, we're looking, trying to figure out the climate on Mars too. Because, okay, I'm saying that liquid water probably doesn't exist on Mars now. There's frozen water. How do we have life? What's going on there? Well, maybe in the past there was liquid water on Mars, okay? So understanding the climate gives us some clues about whether there might have been water in the past. Characterizing the geology of Mars. Now, I'm a geologist by training, so I like this stuff. But um, what I think is really cool about geology is that what you're seeing is the history of rocks written in this, the soil and, and so forth. So you're seeing the history of a planet you see the pressure and temperature conditions under which particular minerals, particular rocks were formed. And that's frozen into the mountains that you see, or into the gullies, or into the valleys, etc. So whenever you look at geology, really what you're looking at is the history of a planet recorded in those rocks. So we're trying to understand on Mars whether we can find history in the planet which looks like there was liquid water there, 
okay? Because we can see whether there's features that are consistent with water, things that look streamlined, grains that are more rounded because the water has smoothed them out, things like that. And then finally, it's this preparing for human exploration. Again, humans need water. So therefore, all of these threads are linked together by this water business, and that's why Mars seems to be so intriguing to human beings. It might be a place for the future as well as a place for the past. So why, what's this Phoenix thing and why is Phoenix going to Mars? Well, Phoenix is following the major NASA objective by following the water, by landing and digging beneath the surface in what we know to be this ice-rich region that Odyssey found. So the, op, the, the ability here then is to provide what geologists call ground truth. We're going to try to reach out and touch that water that Odyssey identified from orbit, which is frankly really cool because, in my opinion, because you can get a hypothesis and you can say, okay, all the evidence appears to line up with this. And what we think this measurement is telling us is that this stuff is water, but really the way to confirm it is to get your hands on it, or as close as possible, by sending a, a robotic geologist to the place where you want to get that confirmation. So that's what Phoenix is going to do, is try to get to that ice. So the goal is to study the history of water in all of its phases with paleohydrological, geological, chemical, and meteorological methods. So what does that mean? It means we're going to look for evidence of the water by looking for the structure of water. We're going to look at the rocks. We're going to look at the chemistry. And then we're going to look at the weather. And I'll tell you about the different instruments that Phoenix is bringing with it in order to do all those pieces. Then the next one is to search for habitable zones. That's a great word, habitable. Say that 25 times fast. By characterizing the subsurface environment in the permafrost region, in this Arctic region, by looking for organic molecules and by performing some sort of wet chemistry, we're actually bringing water to Mars, and we'll talk about that later, on wet soils and also by looking at the soil grains. So we're going to figure out what, whether, whether this region of Mars could have been a place where life could have arisen in the past. Okay, so habitable zone, what does that mean? For something to live, as, to, to make life as we know it, as we say, you have to have an energy source, you have to have organic molecules, and you have to have water, back to that water again. So an energy source, we got sunlight, all right? We also, there's, there's um, kinds of uh, microorganisms that use chemical energy instead. They use sulfates. And it just so happens that spirit and opportunity found a lot of sulfates at their landing sites. So sulfates are on Mars. We know that. And we also know that these microorganisms on Earth use sulfates. Hmm, very interesting. Um, we also have to have organic molecules. Organic molecules are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and then maybe a little nitrogen thrown in for flavor, a little phosphorus, a little sulfur. Uh, so all of these things are what make up an organic molecule. And by looking for the energy source, check, light, we looking for the organic molecules, eh, maybe, we don't know, we'll see, and looking for the, the liquid water possibility in the past, looking pretty good, we could f discover or determine whether this region could be a place for life in the past. What is this Phoenix thing? Well, as the name suggests, Phoenix has risen from the ashes. It is a reflight of spare parts that were put on the shelf. In 1998, the Mars Polar Lander had a very bad day. And the lander spacecraft, we call this the spacecraft bus, okay, uh, didn't quite make it for various reasons. And Rob Manning, I think, will go into that in great detail. So I'm going to just let that one sit for a moment. Um, and then there was supposed to be a reflight of that same lander bus in 2001. But since Mars Polar Lander had such a bad day, it was decided, hold on, we want to figure out what happened before we try to send this same thing again. So 2001 was put on hold. 
and the spacecraft bus was put in, in, in bonded stores, as it's called. In addition to that, there were other parts of those two spacecraft that Phoenix is reusing. Turns out that the, I think it's the, um, ah, I think this is the back shell. Okay, good. <laughs> and, the, um, and the solar array is from 2001. In addition, there are some scientific instruments that came from both Mars Polar Lander and then a couple of things from 2001 that were also reused. So Peter Smith, principal investigator of Phoenix from the University of Arizona, had this great idea in uh, 2003 or so that he'd grab all these parts out of bonded stores, you know, bolt them all together, come up with a new objective and send them off to Mars. It'll be great. It'll be easy. It'll be, you know, no problem. We'll just do it. So here we are, fast forward, all May, what is today? May 15, 2008, and 10 days from now, the Phoenix will land on Mars. The combination of all these things. What are we bringing with us? Scientific payload is what... Uh, these, the engineers and the scientists call the, the instruments, the, the scientific experiments that are put on top of a spacecraft bus. So what are we bringing here? We've got quite a few things. We thought Peter, Peter had a very ambitious goal when he put this together in that this is no simple spacecraft. So we've got cameras. We've got a camera that we can use. It has color stereoscopic vision, so it can tell ranging. So it's got two eyeballs, right? And so you can figure out how far away things are. Um, in addition to that, it's got a robot arm camera on the end, so it can see when it's, when it's using its robotic arm. It can look inside its scoop and see what it's picked up. In addition to that, it's got a microscope. So it can see at the um, centimeter and, excuse me, millimeter scale. And in addition to that, it's got an instrument called the atomic force microscope, which is like a little seismograph. And when you get a, a, a bunch of grains on, the, on, a, on a substrate, on a little surface, it actually kind of does a little, has like a little needle that, that um, does a map of the grains of the surface of the, of the material that is on that substrate. So, and that's at the nanometer scale. So we can see all these terrific scales all the way down. And that will be a first for another planet, is to get that kind of difference in scales of, of um, the same materials, which is really kind of a neat thing. In addition to that, there's two chemistry experiments that are being brought along. One of them is called the MECA. And this is quite a mouthful. I like the, the acronym MECA better because it's the Microscopy, Electrochemistry, and Conductivity Analyzer. Yeah. Okay, so what that is, it's a little chemistry beaker, basically, and we're going to add water to the beaker, then we dump soil in, we stir it around, we add a reagent, okay, and we get a little chemical reaction. And then we see what the chemical reaction is, and we figure out what kind of chemistry is there. So that way we can establish what the pH is of the soils. And the other uh, chemistry experiment that we're bringing with us is the TIGA. That's the Thermal and Evolved Gas Analyzer. Basically, that thing, uh, so for the technical folks, it's a differential scanning calorimeter coupled to a mass spectrometer, okay? But for the rest of us, what that means is that we've got ovens that analyze gases and look for organic molecules, okay? That we can understand. In addition to that, on the end of the robotic arm, which is uh, this right here, there is, so we've got the camera, and then we've got this other thing, which is called the thermal and electroconductivity probe. So you see conductivity here, conductivity here. This is considered part of the MECA instrument, even though it's, it's really a long way away, you know, all the way over there from it. But it's still uh, um, operated by the same folks who are doing the, the MECA analysis. And what that little guy is, is a set of needles that you can stick into the ground and figure out how heat diffuses between the different needles. And in that way, you can figure out how fast that, that um, diffusion of heat is tells you about what the materials are. And in fact, if there's water that in, in that soil as ice or liquid or something, uh, you can tell the difference, um, it changes how fast that heat diffuses from one needle to another. So this is the mecha wave, you know, you say hi. Um, 
So that's the TECP there, and then we have a Canadian contribution as well. We have the MET, which is the meteorological package. So this is the weather station on Mars. We're going to measure pressure and temperature uh, at three different points on this mass. I think one is like right down around here, there's another one, and there's one up there. And the fact is, is that that way we can get what the winds are like blowing past the lander, what the temperature is like. And uh, Pathfinder did this, but we've never actually had this kind of measurement at a polar region. So those of us who've studied the poles for a long time are very excited to get finally a weather station in this critical part of the planet. Also, there's this LIDAR, which stands for Light Detecting and Ranging. And basically, it's a laser. And, oh yeah, you can see the laser there. It, you, it's, it's, it is, in fact, a green laser that shoots up into the sky. And the laser beam bounces off of particles that are in the atmosphere. So when you have a high concentration of particles, it bounces, your, your signal is, is diffused more or changes, okay? And so they can establish whether there are clouds on Mars and at what speeds they're coming across, you know, passing over that laser beam. That's pretty good. I can see it there. Um, and uh, you can figure out whether they're dust clouds, whether they're water ice clouds, whether they're CO2 clouds. All of those things can be distinguished by this LIDAR. So pretty complicated set of instruments we're bringing to Mars. It's going to be kind of a cool thing, I think. Getting it ready. This is what it looks like. This tells you a little bit about scale. Those of you who um, know folks at JPL, this is Chris Lewicki here, apparently. And um, these are the solar panels, the solar arrays. They sort of unfurl like fans coming out. And this is a, a very crucial part of this mission to make sure that these guys deploy properly because this is, in fact, a solar-powered mission. So we get power from the arrays that charges the battery, which is underneath, and then the battery is what powers the instruments. Okay. Oops. Launch. This thing launched just this past August, so it's about a nine-month journey. Went off quite successfully, and in fact, don't have a picture here, but the steam trail from the rocket as it was going out, you could see it sort of spiraling up and around, and I swear to God, everybody thought it looked like a phoenix bird. It was really cool. <laughs> Where are we going? Arrives May 25th in the Martian Arctic at about 68 degrees north and 23 degrees east. My north, it looks like a cutoff there. Uh, so that is, it, there, there we are, okay, and it looks like it's about the Northwest Territories in Canada. Phoenix is going as far north as we've ever gone with a Mars mission. Viking, for example, landed at 47 degrees north latitude, and before Phoenix, that was as far north as we had gotten. It's interesting because the, it's a site that has geomorphological landforms indicative of ice. So that means that there's shapes that look like ice worked on them, okay? Then it also has, this site has the right balance of soil over ice. So I told you about the MECA instrument, and it wants to, it's bringing water with it, but it wants to take soil and dump it in and mix it up, you know, and see how those little reactions work. Well, you know, you need soil to do that. So we didn't want to land on the polar cap itself because the soil is interesting to us. We can do an awful lot of science just on the soil. So I wanted to make that point because everybody asks me, okay, well, why aren't you landing on the cap itself? You know, if you're going, oh, water, 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 you know, yeah, give me a break. Tell me what, just land on the cap already and get it over with. Okay. Um, then there's also, uh, whoops, got that one twice. And then the last one is ev uh, access to evaporates, evaporites or alteration products. So evaporites are things that come out of water. So, for example, you know when you water your potted plants and you water them, you water them, you water them, and, and then you start getting sort of this little like cruddy white stuff that builds up around the pot edges? Those are evaporites. Those are salts. So we're looking for those cruddy little white bits on Mars. Uh, we're, we're looking for salts. We're looking for things that evaporate out of water. And uh, you can only get certain kinds of minerals when water is present. So that's what we're, we're looking for that as well. Ooh, falling into the holes. Um, okay. So have to figure out where to land. You know, it's got to be not too scary, 
but still very interesting. You know, it's got to be just right. And there's a whole lot of different pieces to try to figure out how a site is just right. So this was the first early decision um, landing site. You'll see that there's all these kind of um, polygonal structures here. Okay, so let's see. These things should be down, and these little bumps should be up. Right. Sometimes when I look at these images, if I, I don't see them properly and they look reversed to me. So those little bumps are all up and these are all down things. Okay. So I just want to get you guys oriented. So to the, the, these polygons are very interesting to us because what that basically is about is you have all this terrain all over this region that has all these cracks on it. And these cracks, we believe, are due to formation of potentially freezing and thawing of materials so that you get fine grain materials that move to the inside and the, the heavier, bigger stuff stays on the edges. All right. Well, one way to establish whether this stuff, whether there was actually ever liquid water here, is what we see in these cracks. And that basically, if these cracks are filled with dust and sand, then it probably means that at least in, in the time that these polygons were formed, there was no liquid water here. If these cracks are filled with ice, then it means that there sort of was, there was water that filled in to those cracks and then froze again. So it's a really quick and easy test to discover whether there was ever liquid water at this site. All right, now let's talk about the bumps. The bumps are boulders. The bumps are really, really large boulders. The bumps are lander killer sized boulders. <laughs> this is a problem. <laughs> so we thought that this place looked really benign until high rise on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, MRO, took pictures of this site at resolutions that we had never seen before. Thank you, high rise. Thank you. Discovered this site that we thought was just easy peasy, no problem. Lander killer. That was in January. This year. Back to the drawing board. Okay, we have spent a lot of uh, MRO's resources, um, Phoenix resources, trying to make sure we could find a location that looked a lot nicer than this. And voila. Nice polygons. Okay, some still some little bumps. Yeah, they're there. But the frequency, the distribution of the rocks, of the lander killer rocks, not so much. We believe that this is uh, somewhere over 95% probability of safe landing site. And um, I'm sure that somebody who could, could correct me and tell me exactly the percentage is probably in this room, but we'll go with over 95% for now. How are we going to communicate with the spacecraft? There is no direct communication with Phoenix. Everything is relayed through orbiting assets, as we call them. So MRO, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, or the Odyssey Orbiter, are all going to take signals to and from Phoenix and then send them back to the Earth. Okay, That creates interesting challenges for us because that means commands are also relayed through these orbiters. So we have no way of directly talking to the spacecraft quickly. If there's an issue, we have to wait till it locks up with an orbiter that's flying over. Okay, so if it's thinking that it's in the wrong direction, it has to do a sort of a sun find and figure out where it's supposed to point so that it finds the orbiter. So there's this is a very tricky challenge. Fortunately, we've got lots of uh, quite bright people, people who are much smarter than I, working on this stuff and they know how to make this work. And I'm Grateful that uh, they're doing that for sure. So what happens when we arrive? Three kind of phases to this mission. The first part is called characterization phase, and that'll be the first eight days or so, eight, ten days of the mission. The intention there is to figure out what this spacecraft can really do and what the environment is really like. So, okay, we tested this thing in a lab, right? So you know what it can do, right? Sure. Okay, but... You know, you have two cars that are pretty much identical, but each one has a few little quirks. You know, you, you have to make sure that you jiggle the key just right or, you know, the seat doesn't sit just exactly the same. So all of those kinds of things 
well, not exactly keys and seats, but you know what I mean, um, on, on a particular spacecraft, you want to make sure that the ones that you've got in, are, are working in the environment in which you're, you're uh, running it. So we're going to spend some time figuring out what our power and our thermal situation truly are on the surface of Mars. And that's the other piece. We have predicts of what Mars is going to be like in this area, but we've never been there. That's why we're going. So once we get there, we want to make sure we understand what the temperatures really are like, what, how clear the atmosphere truly is, how cold does it really get at night. So, you know, we've got models and simulations where we've tested everything against the worst case cold, so it always gets the coldest at night, and it gets the hottest during the day, you know, and the lander is tilted the furthest away from the sun, so we get as little power as we possibly could. I mean, we make sure that we are robust to all of these conditions, but what we want is it to be better than robust, right? So that's what we're going to figure out, okay, is so that we're not just kind of sort of limping along. Well, we can do our whole, all of our scientific objectives if we pile up all those worst cases. So we're really expecting on the science team a good day because we're going to be better than all those, those stacked worst case, as they're called. So that's what we do in characterization is figure out how we work. Then we're going to start kind of loosening up and getting going, all right? So, but we still have our training wheels on for the first 30 days or so. And the reason there is because we don't want to do something too fast. We don't want to screw up the spacecraft. We just, we got to sort of make sure that we're doing everything right. So we're going to sort of go a little more slowly for the first 30 days. And then, thank you. Hey, there's my 90 days of operations. So, and then we have our, to, out to our full 90 sols of operations. So that is a days or sols. Um, the Martian day is a little bit, about 40 minutes longer than an Earth day. So, but it's still a, um, we, we call it a day just because it's easier, where we call it a sol is, is the other word for it. Um, so this is what our, we are funded for currently. We are, if we're doing really well, we also have um, plans for, what we, for our extended mission. And that would be kind of a, a climate modeling and sort of a weather station monitoring kind of period. So in this time frame, we are going to do a series of cyclic actions. And I call this lather, rinse, repeat. What we're going to do is we're going to dig a little bit of soil and then we're going to document what we picked up. And then we're going to dump it into our thermal and evolved gas analyzer, our TIGA. We're going to dump some into our MECA microscope and take a look at it. And these are all different days that we do each of these activities. And we go through that kind of cycle of analyzing our samples. Um, and we choose our samples for scientifically interesting uh, places. So we're, we're digging down, and the fact is, is that once we find something in this, in this trench that looks interesting to us, we'll stop and take a sample there. Well, that's one point I wanted to make also, which is that unlike the Spirit and Opportunity rovers, this is a lander. So you saw that landing site that, that, I, that I showed you. It looked pretty benign, right? Well, the, the notion there is that the scientific discoveries at the Phoenix landing site are down beneath the ground where that ice might be, as opposed to a long track, which is what Spirit and Opportunity were doing. They were roving to go find their discoveries, whereas we are digging to find our discoveries. So we're going to do this series of um, activities repeatedly throughout, well, the characterization phase, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, so we'll do sort of one of those, potentially, not quite, in that um, characterization phase. But then we'll sort of keep doing it over and over again until we've used all of our ovens. Now, we're bringing eight ovens with us. Mecca has four little beakers that, with it we can add water to. And then the microscope has 10 locations where we can dump soil on it and, and take a look at those grains. So all in all, we can analyze 22 unique samples, which is pretty good. OK. All right, so now. I'm going to hand it over to Rob, and he is going to tell you about how we got to this place and where we're headed.
All right. Thank you, Joe. I hope you were taking notes. Um, I, I'm still learning all this stuff. I, I'm, I am an engineer. Uh, yes. Oh, I just wanted to ask a quick question. I'm not sure. Oh, yes. You, should we ask questions now or should we ask at the end? How we, how we wholly do a whole at the end, okay? Because we'll, we'll both be up here. You can ask us a bunch of questions, okay? Okay, so I'm going to actually seg segue. Like I said, I'm an engineer. I do love Mars, but I don't know much about it other than what my, all my, my, my scientist friends tell me about it. And I've, I've learned a ton, I have to say. But, you know, actually, if you go back in time, um, this is how scientists and engineers thought we were going to land on Mars, can you imagine this? This was a, this is the, the first landers were visioned by Werner von Braun in the 50s. And this is the, his idea of a lander. This is a 170 meter wingspan aircraft that could carry 17 people. And the idea was it would take quite a few years to develop it. And I, they thought, well, you know, if you give enough time, maybe 1981, they can do it. <laughs> well, and you know, I thought that was actually pretty brilliant of it. Um, uh, can you imagine l landing with skids on Mars? That would be kind of fun. I don't, I'm sure I'm, I don't think I'm brave enough to do that. Hang on a second. This is almost going to take a second. So, so, th so this is how the view, this is how I grew up thinking Mars is, landing on Mars is going to take place. Um, come on, you can do it. You can do it. There we go. The real truth of the matter is um, <clears throat> it's really hard, and uh, we actually don't do it that well, it turns out. Um, uh, and I say we, I mean the human, the human race and the, the, those of us on, on, who've been, on this planet who've been fortunate enough to try. Um, uh, from the USSR, the United States, and Europe, we've had our share of ups and downs. And uh, you can see our success rate isn't terribly great. You might also notice something else. All these, these are the various pictures of various kind of landing vehicles that landed. You might notice something. You don't see a pattern. <laughs> we haven't actually figured it out how to do it right yet. Um, uh, which is, uh, which, is this a good thing or a bad thing? We're experimenting. Um, uh, and Phoenix is our next experiment, and I'll tell you more about that in a second. But there have been five that have worked. Uh, the Russians actually got one to land and lasted just for a few minutes before it died. Um, I'm not sure whether they count that as success or not. I don't think they do. Um, so I was fortunate to uh, be responsible for uh, with the teams, work, working with the teams on f three of those five. I was in high school when the first two happened, the Viking missions. Uh, but these are the five, right down here with the X's. They, and, the, and this is the entire surface of Mars in relief. And this is where Phoenix is going, as, as Deborah mentioned. Um, but the, but there haven't been that many of them. Uh, and but the, this is the, so so we really are making a big step uh, in the next couple of weeks when we actually get Phoenix to land safely, as I'm quite confident we will. But you know we've had our uh, we've I said we've had our ups and downs. Uh, we, had a, we had a really big down in 1999. Some of you remember? Yeah, some of you, I remember. Um, our first down, you know, and it's, it, these are, it's, it's a great tale, not because it, it, it can be, you can say, well, this is embarrassing. We can't talk about it. Well, you know, we're human, human beings, you know, this, and this is hard business. Our, our, first, our first bad day occurred in September in 1999 when Mars Climate Orbiter uh, the, the first of a, of a series of pairs of missions to go out to Mars, uh, just, to, just two years after Mars Pathfinder landed, was, was, uh, was headed out to Mars. And, and unfortunately, um, this, is the, this is the one that Jay Leno loved to joke, that you don't have to be a rocket scientist to be a rocket scientist. <laughs> um, well, it, it's pretty true. I don't think I've ever met a rocket scientist myself. Um, but it, it turns out that we had a units error. We, the spacecraft reported its, uh, how, what it was, do, what, where it was firing its thrusters, in which direction, in, in the units of uh, pounds, force, and we believed in our software in the ground, believed it was uh, newtons, the, the metric. So there was an English metric conversion error. And, and it turns out, he says, well, how can you make such a crazy mistake? Well, first off, we make thousands and thousands of mistakes. The, the trick is, you know, we, we like not to make mistakes, but we, we're human beings. We make lots of mistakes. And so 
So the trick is actually not so much not making a mistake, but catching your mistakes. And that was the problem here. The real error was not the units conversion error. It was just that we didn't realize how important it was to, to understand what the spacecraft was doing. It turns out it was firing its thrusters and was moving across the sky. What, and we didn't have a way to independently check that that was true or not. It was just moving across the sky and getting closer to Mars to the left. And all we can do is measure how far away it is from Earth with our radio system and, and how fast it's moving away from us. And it's very difficult to know the difference. And if your spacecraft is kind of lying to you, you know, you have to trust it. We needed to figure out a way to prove that that was, that, 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 that was, uh, uh, that the spacecraft was, and our software agreed with each other. And we didn't. So guess what? The orbiter became a lander. <laughs> Not good. I won't say that the lander became an orbiter because it actually also landed, we believe. Um, this is the Mars Polar Lander, and just a few months later, and by the way, this is a great group of t people. I, mean, I have to say, the team members who do this, my, are my friends, I still work with them every day. They're a great, great group of people. Um, it just tells you how close it we are all the time from failure and success. Well, we believe that the most, uh, the, the, what happened, with, this is, the lander is actually an interesting story because it, it, this is a low, very low cost mission. One of the things to do, we did to save money was we decided not to have a radio on it when it was landing. Now, we has a radio on the surface, but to put all the equipment on there and to make the antennas work and everything else would have been, oh, expensive. And uh, although it, it, we do it now, uh, <laughs> and you'll notice that in two weeks. Uh, but the, the, land, the, the lander, so what happens, it turns this radio off as, as it lands, and it lands running software automatically. Now, Mars is uh, light minutes away, 11, 20 light minutes away. Um, and people, like uh, this gentleman over here wrote the EDL software from Mars Pathfinder, he happened to be here, um, writes a software who runs on board the vehicle, and it, and it does it automatically. So the vehicle has to do everything by itself. We don't, no joysticking from Earth, no, none of that. It's just too far away. It has to have all the smarts on board to do everything it needs to do to land safely and deploy everything and get itself in a happy, healthy situation on Mars. So here on Earth, we're just watching it all happen. Well, <clears throat> unfortunately, when this thing turned its radio off, we couldn't watch anything. We just went, okay, watching the signal, okay. Ah, okay, any second now. <laughs> Nothing. That's when I got really nauseous, and I left, uh, because we didn't get a signal back, and we never did, and we never heard from it again. And we, to this day, I, I believe it's on Mars, <laughs> in the South Pole. But it's not there now. Uh, it was, it's not there working. And, and we don't know whether it looks, it might even be looking something like that. Happy, going like, hey, where are you? And the radio is broken or something. Who knows? <laughs> but we, um, we don't know. It, uh, the most likely explanation that we've used uh, and, and is that it turned off due to a software bug that was found after, after landing, that it may have turned off its engines inadvertently due to, due to so a very subtle software bug and fallen 40 meters to the ground. But we don't know that. And uh, in fact, ooh, you can help. This is interesting. If you go to the, uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter high-rise site, this is, the, this is the, the big orbiter that has a big spy-in-the-sky telescope. There's a, there's a website you can go visit, and, and you, can, you can go look and actually, uh, if you go to their blog there, you can actually start looking, for, looking through images that we took in the southern part of Mars, and maybe you will find it there lying there, but these pictures are huge. I mean, imagine this whole room being covered with pictures and the lander is the size of a head of a pin. So if you've got good eyes and a lot of time, free time in your hands, go to it. I gave up. It's not there, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so, so we looked, we're gonna keep looking again. So, okay, so what happened? So what did we do after we had this failure? Boy, imagine everybody, we're all depressed. The team worked so hard. Oh, it was just, it was, it was tragic, really. You know, and that could happen. That can happen to all of our missions. But so NASA had to do something. They felt that we, since we didn't know why it failed, we couldn't exactly launch its, its sister, the Mars 01 lander. So as Deborah said, we had to put that in, in mothball storage. And it got covered with plastic, and the clean room was sitting there for years. But NASA said, listen, we, we can't land that now because we don't know what happened. So a couple of us came together and said, you know what? We landed Mars Pathfinder in 1997. It bounced to the, on the surface of Mars. And we drove a little Sojourner rover around the surface of Mars for about three months in 19, 1997. What if, what if we take the white box out, throw, dump away this little rover, it's too small anyway, throw this white box away and convert it into a rover? 
and stuff her over there. Put wheels, take that whole, the box has got electronics and radios and stuff in it, and computers, and a computer. Let's stuff it all in here and put wheels on it, put solar panels on top, and let it drive off. Wouldn't that be cool? And we could use the same landing system. And because we're doing the same design, we can do it all in three years, because this, is, this was, this was uh, in April, uh, April, May time frame that we're talking about this. So we said, well, you know, in three years, it'll launch. How tough can that be? Well, that became Mars Exploration Rover. And uh, at, it turns out we happened to get done in time, but just by the skin of our teeth. Oops. So, so you might say, well, OK, well, this is a little confusing. Okay, you, OK, you bounced the two rovers on Mars. And now you're using rockets to land. I'm very confusing. What are you guys doing? So well, let me give a little, little story here. Because this all, this all started back when I was graduating from high school, 1976. The two Vikings landed on Mars. And they used these really cool engines. They're very expensive, very precision throttled engines that can control its speed. And it, and, uh, it turned out that was a very expensive, multi-billion dollar program in the 70s to, to, being the, to be the first missions to land on Mars to, to see if there was life on Mars. Well, they didn't find any life on Mars. And for, so what happens is NASA lost interest in Mars until 1997. <laughs> There's a huge gap. We suddenly, they, they said, well, we'd like you to go back to Mars. But we said, you know, listen, those throttle engines, it's like it takes years and years to develop that. And the people who built those engines are no longer around. They're retired. It's all long gone. I, I, there's no way we can pull it off. So we came up with this, this idea of using airbags and solid rocket motors and parachutes and this very group Goldbergian contraption of stuff um, to land on this, this uh, godforsaken planet. <laughs> it's not good for landing. I don't recommend it. Um, so, so we did, and we were successful. But while we were doing this design, before it ever landed, um, I, 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 we said, well, we're not sure this is going to work. So let's try something else in parallel. And another group of people, another team, uh, including my, uh, mostly centered with our, our friends, uh, our engineering friends out at Lockheed Martin in Denver, uh, built up the Mars Polar Lander and, it, and, and tried to get a whole other set of engine design working. Now, these engines are not the same as Vikings. They said, listen, we don't need, what if we don't have to use throttle engines that are very hard. What if we use standard off the shelf, low cost engines that instead of leaving them on and controlling the, the flow so you can control your speed, we will just go, we'll just turn them on and off really fast. <laughs> really, really fast. Like if you're with machine guns really fast, you can actually fly with machine guns. You have enough of them. <laughs> well, that's what they did, but it was lost. OK, so it disappears. So and then, meanwhile, <laughs> Mars rovers come along again, and we bounce along at Mars again. OK, now that's really confusing. OK, we do the two. Now Phoenix comes along. Why is Phoenix coming along? Because Phoenix is the mission that was canceled after Mars Polar Line didn't work. It was the one that was in progress, under construction, almost done even, back, back in 1999. So now Phoenix comes along. The proposal comes along, uh, Peter Smith at uh, and Tucson says, you know, let's recover that thing. The guys in Denver, Denver say, yes, let's do it. And we say, yes, but let's fix it. And we go, fix what? Because we don't know why it didn't work. So now we have to figure out, now we have to do this is, OK, we've got time this time. Let's take the time. Let's go through and figure out everything that could possibly go wrong and peel onion and make sure that we really understand it. In fact, let's build up a whole lander, full scale, put it and, and fire the engines as if you, like you're really laying on Mars. Now, we wouldn't actually land it because it's, there's some problems with Earth and, and ha safety hazards and stuff. But we put it in a big room uh, out in, uh, in Denver and fire the engines into the full scale hot fire test and tr tested this out. And we learned all sorts of things. We did dozens of radar, radar t flight tests that we never did before. We learned all sorts of new things about the system. We found lots of little bugs, a lot of things to fix, and we did. And, 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 this, and the team, I'm very proud to say, I, we ran out of stuff to fix. It is really, it's really, I'm very proud of the team. They, they've really, really done an amazing job, and I've been with them the, uh, the whole way the last two and a half years, and I've been very proud of them. Okay, well, <clears throat> so is this the end all be all of landing on Mars? Well, let me just take one other thing. OK, this rover that bounces on surface weight is about 170 kilograms of a rover, about this big. It is back in the corner. Um, it carries only 20 kilograms 
of scientific instruments inside that rover. That's all we could fit in there. And we can't, we've decided we can't make that any bigger. But, but if you don't want to drive around, something like the Phoenix Lander, this design is actually really great to bringing 60 kilograms of stationary science and science instruments to the surface of Mars. And it's provided you don't, you, uh, you don't need to drive around. So it's a great, these are just great complementary designs. They're very different, but they do different things and they specialize in different ways. I, would, I wouldn't want to land this in the big rocket rocker, big uh, boulder field, but this guy doesn't seem to mind it so much. But, so we, but we can't get enough mass on there, so we're trying something new. And we're, there's a big experiment in progress that I'm now involved in, which is called the Mars Science Laboratory, which instead of uh, bouncing or landing your payload on a rocket, it's actually going to lower the, the rover to the surface of the ground on a, on a, on a, a, a triple of cables, seven meter cables. But this is not what this talk's about. That's another talk. You can come back. We'll talk about it later. So, well, how about humans? Oh, shoot. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> you know, um, this is a cartoon we made uh, of what a, what a human entry descent landing system on Mars might look like. It's very creepy looking. It, you imagine that you have a shuttle, something about the size of the shuttle. You, you don't need wings, so you don't, you're not going to land on a run. There's no runways on Mars. <laughs> uh, unless you have skid strips, like you know, Werner von Braun thought. So, but, but if you do is you open up these great, big, inflatable, one idea is this big, giant, inflatable tension cone. Imagine it's a big, it's a big, big, uh, big uh, kite <laughs> with, with a big tube around it full of pressurized air to slow you down with the thin air atmosphere of Mars. And then, the, then a heat shield falls away. You open that up. This opens up, by the way, at about, oh, I think we figured out it was about uh, 4,000 miles an hour. Really fast. Yeah, kind of creepy, huh? And it has to open up in about, a, about two, three seconds. And then the, the lander, the heat shield falls away. This happened. This whole thing happens very, very quickly, and the thing lands. And then down at the bottom, you land on the moon. But you can see the size of it compared to a 747. It's pretty large. And you need something large because you need to get the astronauts back off the ground. Because it, it's, Mars is a bigger place than the moon, so you need a bigger la launch vehicle. So, well, so that's the story with that. But, let, but let's see, what's Phoenix going to do? What's, what's going to happen in two weeks? That's what's really exciting, because that's real. And so it's starting off, and I've got to check. Uh, by the way, wait, Mark, you're, one of the navigators, the navigators are here. Who's driving? You guys are, but how can you be here? Shouldn't you be? I don't, someone else is driving. Ah, oh, it's the other shift, yeah. I can't remember whether I'm using uh, Earth receive time or spacecraft time on this. Ah, darn it, you have to add, what, 15, 13 minutes? 15 minutes. Okay, so all these times, I, I realize I pulled it off the wrong number, all these times add 15 minutes, because that's how long it takes. This happens the time, if you are looking at your watch at 4.30 on Sunday, two weeks from now, actually, week, two week and a half from now, you look, on the, you look on your watch and say, at 4.30, that's entering the atmosphere, but then you don't know anything about it because the signals that tell us what it's doing are kind of walking across the solar system. 15 minutes later, we go, yay, it's entered the atmosphere. So what we do is we pretend like that speed of light thing isn't there. So, we, so, I really, so what really happens is at 4.45, it enters the atmosphere. So all these date times add 15 minutes to that. Okay, so first off, what happens is this, this eight and a half foot diameter entry capsule um, under the control of its own software, after, after dumping off the cruise stage a few minutes earlier, hits the atmosphere going about 13, almost 13,000 miles an hour. It's pretty fast, huh? But that's actually not too bad. Um, the atmosphere, although it's very thin on Mars, since you're moving so fast through it, it's kind of like entering on Earth. It's not that different. But <coughs> things start looking a little different when you get lower. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> while, while, so while, while you're still going about 1,000 miles an hour, we open this. Uh, disc gap band parachute is the same parachute we use for Viking. In fact, the same capsule design, the same thermal, the same heat ma shield material. This heat shield material is really cool. Um, it's actually made of cork wood mixed together with epoxy, stuffed into phenolic honeycomb uh, uh, spacers, and that's not the magic ingredient. The magic ingredient is these almost microscopic gas-filled glass balls. It's really cool. The gas pops out of the glass, comes out of the glass, and it interacts with the atmosphere and actually produces what we call an ablator, where the, the, the heat, the, the actual gas itself that leaves the heat shield takes the heat away, thankfully, because the heat shield will melt and the spacecraft will too. 
Um, so, so, uh, so this thing is the, the heat shield is feeling you know, one, one, one to two thousand degrees uh, Celsius. In fact, just an inch or two away from that, it's the temperature of the gas is almost the temperature of the surface of the sun. Yet, just on the inside, about this far away from the heat shield, on the inside, it doesn't even get up to room temperature. It's very, it's amazing. But you know, this lasts for a few minutes. We enter the atmosphere, and then finally, this parachute opens up at about forty thousand feet. Uh, 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 high uh, air, uh, airliner high altitude, and about a 25-foot uh, cannon launch mortar, mortar launch, mortar cannon launch parachute is boom, launched out um, out of the back and inflates about a, in about a second and a half. It's very quick. You're moving it fast, so it wouldn't, you'd expect it wouldn't take that long to fill it up, would it? Okay, um, and then a few, and then and about uh, uh, 15 seconds later, this hot heat shield, you don't need that anymore. We let it go, let it tumble away, and it has its own uh, uh, flight to the ground. It's gonna, it beats the vehicle to the ground. And then uh, we're almost there. Now, they have, 10, seconds, 10 seconds after that, you can deploy the lander legs. And the lander legs pop out, pyrotechnically activated. Of course, the software is doing this, looking at its watch and hitting buttons at the right time, firing pyrotechnic devices. Um, it's not a safety hazard because we're nowhere, nowhere nearby. Uh, and, uh, and then the radar starts looking for the ground. That's the kind of the key point. Turns out the software really doesn't know where the ground is, and neither do we that well. We know we're kind of up there somewhere, so we have to keep looking for the ground with the radar by sending a radar signal to the ground, and we can measure first the altitude, and we also have to, also, in order to land this thing safely, we also have to know how fast you are moving relative to the ground, and we do that while we're suspended on the parachute. So what about landing? Well. Um, while we're on the parachute, the, par the software is on, going, on board, the vehicle is going, you know, okay, I'm going this fast, I'm this high, um, about, right, right about now I should, I'm around 2,000 feet high, I'm going to let go of the back shell, and the software fires more pyrotechnic devices, separation nuts, and releases the lander from the back shell, and it falls away from the back shell and the parachute above it, and really, li literally just plummets, just for, for, for a second or two, while it starts its engines. <laughs> No, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's like, and, 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 and remember I said the little pulse, these are the little pulse engines. It's the same design as Mars Polar Lander. It uses these little pulsed engines. In fact, you can see them right there. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Little ones going all the way around. And, and, and in fact, this, this event is actually one of the more exciting events. Um, depending how fast that back shell is swinging, this lander could actually do a complete backflip. Back <laughs> Probably won't. Probably won't. But you know, I'm actually. If it does, it'll be fine. It'll just go. Whoa. Okay. Up is that way, and and it, for, and the first thing it does after it separates, it says, "Oh, oh parachute back shell got it run out of the way." So it runs out of the way, moves out of the way from the back shell. Didn't do that last. There's a few things we added to it. Doesn't do that. Didn't do that in the first time. Um, although it's unlikely that the thing will come back and whack the lander. Um, best to stay away. You know, let's not take unnecessary chances. And there's plenty of time. And, uh, and, then, and we start the engines, the 12 engines. There they are right there. And then, and then starting about, so, so uh, let's see, I think actually this, yeah, it's about right. So it slows down from this 100, and by the way, it's going 125 miles an hour toward the ground. It's still pretty fast. And you say, well, that's how fast skydivers fall out of the airplanes without parachutes. Well, we're in Mars, everybody, and parachutes don't work very well when you get down to low. Um, they just, it's, there's just not enough air there. So you really are screaming toward the ground very quickly when you fall out. So this thing has a lot of speed to get rid of. It needs to go from 125 miles an hour to about six miles an hour in the last 100 feet, where it, goes, where, where it has by then uh, eliminated its horizontal velocity and decided to go straight down like this. And, and by then, it, 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 knows, it knows where it is and it knows how fast it is relative to the ground. But because we're not exactly sure with the radar exactly where the ground is, what we do is we just go like this. Okay, made it. And, and when the legs make contact with the ground, they crush a little bit because um, six miles an hour is, is, pretty, is pretty fast, respectable, you know, clunk. Um, and, the, and, this, and the software takes that information, quickly shuts the engines off, and then waits and, and, and then touch down. By the way, guess what? We're listening to this whole thing while it's going on. We can actually, we, we, this, this, this vehicle has, has a, an antenna uh, where is it on this picture here? I don't see it. Uh, it's right back there. It's right about here. There's an antenna here. There's an antenna back here. And it will be able to see most of this stuff 
cross your fingers, via data that it relays up to the Odyssey spacecraft as well as the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft, which then routes it back to the Deep Space Network back uh, scattered around the planet here and then routes it back here to Billing 264 we'll, and Billing 230. We'll be we'll watching all this stuff. And so we'll be actually seeing this, and uh, Richard Kornfeld is going to be watching this, and he's going to be reporting all this information and, uh, in real time, and he'll be able to tell us when we actually land, 15 minutes after it really happened, of course. <laughs> okay, 20 minutes later, but, but by, uh, and so we'll get all this information, and, and it'll be very great, we'll be excited, we'll be yelling and screaming, but the solar panels haven't come out yet. So the vehicle really isn't safe. But, and by then, the orbiters have passed over. Now we, we don't have contact with it anymore. But 20 minutes later, the solar rays on their own open up one at a time, very slowly. Hopefully there are no rocks to bump into. Uh, and because you saw the picture, not that many rocks out there. So it's, it, it, it's a nice, perfect space place for this kind of lander. And the solar panels open up, and it'll be happy. And we'll get pictures back that later that day. And uh, it's going to be a very exciting night. So... Um, so the rest of this summer, it's digging, digging away. So I'm done with my portion of the talk, and uh, Deborah and I will be around for questions. If you have any questions, thank you very much for your time. Come on up. Yes, sir. Are you going to have the landing ride on NASA again? Yes. yes. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, will this be live on NASA TV? I think it'll be live on NASA TV and probably CNN. I think they're, I think they're talking about it. I've, I've heard that. Yeah. Were those times Eastern Those are all Pacific time. 15 minutes early, but yes. Pacific time, our time locally. Uh, nice. The sun, this, is, this is a rare ch chance where it's, it's about the same time of day on Mars as it is on Earth. That almost never happens. We're either, and it's either in the middle of the night here on Earth or in the evening, and it's morning on Mars, or in the after late afternoon, they're all disconnected. But this is an odd coincidence. That's a friendly Earth, friendly time. We'll, we'll get to you later, John. <laughs> yes. So the, the question is, are we going to have a microphone so that we can hear what's going on on Mars? Um, tricky question. Tricky? Tricky, as a matter of fact, because... There is going to be a microphone on this one, but we've had some complications. And it turns out that the, the way the microphone is situated, we weren't, it's, it's kind of a, this is one of those holdovers from Mars Polar Lander. And since there was a microphone on that particular one, there's a microphone here. But we never intended to use it on Phoenix. And in fact, it's on a particular power switch that is not necessarily going to be used once it gets on the ground. Right, your congressman. No. Yeah, tricky. <laughs> I'm joking. Tri Thank you. I'm tricky, joking. Tricky question. Tricky question. Yes. Will there be a, a live feed to the observatory at Griffith Park of uh, this landing? Will there be a live feed to the Griffith Observatory uh, for this landing? And you know, I, I do not know the answer to that. I don't either. Uh, um, that's Nagy a good does. question. Okay. Nagi Cox. Yeah, there will be a live feed. Yes, there will be. The answer is yes. Thank you, Nagi. She's She knows. Cool. Let's let's uh, let's go to the back part of the room there. How yes. far down will you be able to dig with the backhoe? Uh, How far down can we dig? Um, about a half a meter. The the good news or bad news, depending on how, whether whether you're more interested in ice or more interested in soil, um, is that we believe from models and also spacecraft data that we think the, the ice is going to be significantly less than a half a meter, so somewhere less than 10 centimeters below the soil. Uh, yes, over here. Rob, uh, what are you most worried about on Sunday? <coughs> what is Rob most worried about on Sunday? Well, since I'm working on MSL. <laughs> um, no, I... I, I Actually, I'm, I'm not worried. I mean, listen, you, I, I know what this feels like. It's, it's very easy to get very anxious and have, you know, clammy fingers, and I'll have that. We all will. But, you know, once you've done everything you think, can think of and you've done, checked everything you can think of and everybody else has done the same and you run out of things to think about, you're done. And so, you know, in some respects, from our perspective, if it doesn't work, it's because we made a mistake a long ago and we never found it. And the problem is, the mistake is, 
In some sense, the, the, the failure has already happened. It's kind of like Schrodinger's cat. The cat's either alive or dead, and we just have to open the box and see which one it is. <laughs> Next question. Yes. Uh, what are your best predictions or range of predictions about how many layers and how far back in time you might be going if you dig? So the question is, how far back in time might we be able to dig depending on you know, how deep things are. Well, the, honestly, we, that is a, um, a puzzle that we've been trying to understand, which is that we really don't have a good sense of what a layer that we've seen. We, we can see layers in the troughs in the polar regions of Mars. So, okay, so there's these curvilinear features. The polar cap kind of looks like a Pac-Man, and you know, there's, there's all these sort of striations in it, okay? And those are actually troughs, and you can see down into them, and you can see that there's layers in those troughs, so we're digging through that in the polar cap, and we believe that we're also landing potentially on some of this layers, on this layer terrain. So, um, and, some, and some crater ejecta from Heimdall and some other things. So anyway, the, the question is, how, how far, what, what is the representative, you know, distance per layer? Could be current day only, could be 10,000 years back, could be tens of thousands of years. We, we don't know. Now, the good news is that we do have um, the ability to measure D to H, so we can see whether the, at least if the water that we see or any, any kind of um, that's bound in the, in the soil, we can see whether it's connected to the atmosphere and through models we can figure out how, whether if there's a connection there, how deep down that model might take us. We also have um, an O18016 measurement we can do, so we can do a little bit of work there. So not really willing to commit, but you know, it's somewhere, I, I, I think we're going we're gonna to get some depth into the history. That was a rambling answer. Yes. How, uh, like, how hard can the soil be and still be able to dig through it? Like, how hard can the soil be and still be able to dig through it? The robotic arm has a number of different mechanisms to get through different hardnesses of, of material. It has a scoop, which works great on loose stuff. It has these little ripper tines, kind of. So it's got it's got like a um, what you use in the garden, you know, the little trowel or whatever that you you know you pull dirt with, or, or um, so you can actually break up clotty stuff with these ripper tines. They actually happen to be on sort of the back of the scoop here. And then in addition to that, it's got a, what's called a rasp, um, and this is a little drill. It's like a little Dremel tool, and it actually comes out of the bottom of the scoop, and you kind of just like a Dremel tool, I use one to take care of my dog's toenails, um, and uh, you know, and it, and you you literally can shave off particles. And the and the good thing is that we can use that to go into ice. And in fact, we know that we can go up, go up to a, at least forty megapascals hardness of soil. So what what is that? That's pretty darn hard. Um, basalt, and we can do those kinds of things, no problem, um, with this rasp. And we, we expect that we can get, it's, it's cement, you know, it's that kind of hardness at, at very cold temperatures. So, in fact, we can get ice, We're, we expect to get ice through this rasping technique, so shaving off little particles like a snow cone, and then put them into the tiga that way. Okay, questions, yes? Yes, you mentioned salt crystal formation in the presentation. I was wondering what kind of information we could hope to get from the analysis of those salt crystals. Okay, so salt crystal formation. Uh, what kind of information can we get from that kind of analysis? Um, that will tell us about, depends on the chemical composition of those salts. That tells us um, what, obviously, what, what kinds of soils might be there and tells us about where the sources of those materials might have come from, since we can see other mineralogical signals from orbit. In addition to that, um, structure will give us information on the conditions under which those things formed, or at least under which they are preserved. So there's quite a bit of information we can get there. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Is, is, um, is, there a, is it because of the location on the planet that you can't communicate directly with? 
Phoenix, or is there some other reason? Okay, so the question was, why aren't we connect, uh, communicating directly with Phoenix? Is it because where we're going? Is that the reason? Well, the reason is, is we don't have an antenna that we can use to communicate directly to Earth. Um, in fact, early on, we made a choice to pull that off due to cost considerations. So we're going to see if this works. <laughs> yes. Um, in your picture on the landing site, there are all these interesting little cracks. There's probably two questions here. One of them is, how much angle do you expect the, you know, the, the slope on those? How much? How much can you handle? It's like, what what is the hazard in those cracks? And the other one is, it sounds like there's some interesting science about them. How close do you have to be in order to, to, to actually get a look? Okay, so a se several part question, which is, I think, what is the general slope of the terrain under which we're going to land, and are those cracks, what if we stick a leg kind of in one of those cracks, and is that a problem? I'm sort of yeah. reinterpreting your question a little bit. And then the second one is, um, how big are those polygons, and can we, can we actually get to them and, and you know, sample those parts. So um, slope, we believe the slope is extremely gentle overall. We believe it's, I think, less than five mm -hmm. degrees. Mm -hmm. And the lander is rated, I think we were looking for slopes less than 12 or less than 16, I can't, uh, something like that, to make sure we were safe. So we're very safe. These are, it's very flat. And in fact, you wouldn't really even notice a slope like that if you were standing on it. Okay. Now, the angle of repose for materials on Mars is about 30 degrees. So that's the other side of the question. What that means is that if you pour a pile of sand, your, your, um, your angle to that pile can be no more than 30 degrees. So that tells you something also. So those troughs won't be greater than that. All right. The other thing, too, though, is that, um, again, it's because of the slope. These cracks are most likely filled up. And so we don't expect to stick a leg down them. On the other hand, they're also of a good size. The size is just right so that we think we're probably going to be able to reach both the crack part and the middle part with our robotic arm. So we, we do believe we're going to be able to access enough information to truly understand that, that sort of hypothesis that I was telling you about earlier. It's pretty exciting. Yes. How long can Phoenix survive on the uh, at, at the pole with uh, the solar panels? How long can the Phoenix survive with the solar panels? I can take that one. Do you want to take that one? Sure. Uh, it looks sure. like it looks like we'll be able to probably survive through into November, uh, about 180 souls. Our biggest issue is we get we run into solar conjunction, which means that Mars gets behind the sun, and so we can't talk to it for a while, a couple, week or two, and so. Uh, at, not long after that, though, we get CO2 buildup, and the CO2 starts accumulating, and solar panels don't like CO2. And so unlike the rovers, which have this propensity to keep rock rolling, and we, we expect them not to keep on going, um, these, this will really, really does have a lifetime. You really have to. So, so we better dig. We have to dig this summer, and we will. Right, we think that sort of January, February time frame will be the, the true end of this mission. Can you expand on that? Is that because of the conditions on Mars? Yes. North. The CO2 comes out of the atmosphere, freezes out. The CO2 atmosphere just freezes up like it condenses right out of the air. Yes, sir. How many points do you plan to do the excavation? One, two, three. How many points do you have? Uh, we, we have at, we're going to do at least three points. We want to do surface, subsurface, and then ice if we can reach it. Location. Uh, one trench? One trench. Not necessarily. It depends on what we find, what looks interesting. We have the capability to do up to eight samples um, with the TIGA, with, the, with that little chemistry experiment, and we can do ten samples with the microscope. So we could, put, we're, the intention is to do similar samples so that we look at them in the mic, we look at the, you know, the chemistry and the microscope stuff of the same sample. However, since there's different numbers of things, we'll choose carefully which ones we want to do where. Yes? Is there any way to view the landing on the NASA website? Is there any way to view the landing on the NASA website? And I believe that NASA TV um, will be um, showing at, at, through the JPL website. Now, we're, we're not 
going to see, actually, of course, the land. It's not like we've got a camera that's going to be sort of taking a, a movie of it. But what we get is these wackadoodle signals that um, other people can seem to analyze and understand, and, and they report back. Richard Kornfeld happens to be one of these people who can interpret this stuff. And so we listen to him, and he tells us what we're seeing on this, you know, this crazy signal. So, yes. Go ahead. Me? Um, what's the program for the digging? Like with the, with the ones that are up there now, they go for a while and stop and then reprogram it. Is this going to dig for a while or is it going to stop every two scoops or what's it going to do? <laughs> Good question. So, Go ahead. So the question was, um, what's the program for operations, basically? Is the intention to kind of keep going, go for broke? Um, like the, the rovers sort of work for a while, then stop, and um, then start up again. Uh, the intention is to try to keep continuously doing some kind of measurement now, um, because why have... A, an asset that we know is going that has a limited lifetime. We don't want to just sit there and do nothing with it. But it might be that some days we do panoramic imaging, and other days we do digging, and another day we might be cooking something in our analyzers. So it's not as though we're going to be digging frantically every day. We're going to be doing a campaign of activities, sort of that makes sense. Now, part of it is that it's a solar panel powered mission. So there's a limited amount of uh, resources we can use every day, which is one of the reasons we sort of break it up into a pattern of days as opposed to just kind of, you know, keeping on going. We have to stop and recharge our battery. So we stop. We stop every night. And then we start again in the morning. So, way in the back, that gentleman over there. Says, Question, Rob. Well, if a computer reboots doing EDL, will it be able to pick back up and burn with the engines? Or will it just. Thank you, Jose. Um, the, the question Jose has is, he's, he's, he's tested these vehicles, he oh, knows. Oh, no, he's um, a plant. He, uh, he's a plant. Um, if, if, there's, if the computer has a reset during entry, entry, set, and landing, this whole process here, what happens? Bad day. And so um, I, uh, uh, we do not have a way to recover. In, fa in fact, that's true for all these vehicles that have to very carefully monitor its position. It really it can't forget. It can't lose the ball. So if you hit the reset button, and the time you've rebooted, chances are you're on the ground in a, in a pieces. However, uh, we've worked very hard to make sure that doesn't happen. All right, let's have thank one you, more Jose. question and end on a, on a happy up note. Yes. Yeah, really, thank you. <laughs> How big an issue is site con contamination from the engines? Um, this was a concern for us for quite a while. We have mitigated it through a number of ways. Number one, we are using ultra-pure hydrazine. So um, we're using the fuel that has very, very few contaminants. The hydrazine fuel itself breaks down into water and nitrogen. Water, eh, no problem. Um, and nitrogen also. We have um, our instruments are capable of detecting compounds that are that include nitrogen, and in which way we have characterized what kinds of compounds we might find on the Martian surface that are a result of that contamination. When there are those um, minute quantities of contaminants in this hydrazine fuel, those are so small that we would not detect them anyway, even if they were present. So we believe that we're doing pretty well in terms of characterizing any kind of contamination. In addition to that, we believe that we can reach over the contaminated spots with our arm and get to a clean, happy place. Okay, and I think since they closed the curtains on us that it's time for us to end. Thank you very much Thank for you. your attention. Thank you.